Nearly every metal list ever published mentions them. They have multiple historically influential and critically acclaimed albums. They are globally recognizable. Could they be the biggest metal act in history? After all, they're practically synonymous with the genre. This is A Beginner's Guide to Metallica. It was Los Angeles. The 80s had just recently begun, when a Danish teenager, who only even moved to the States to train professionally in continuing his family lineage of pro tennis players, put out an ad in the newspaper looking for bandmates to jam with. Five months later, music history would be changed forever as Metallica was officially formed. Their prime lineup as we know it would be Lars Ulrich on drums, James Hetfield on guitar and vocals, Cliff Burton on bass guitar, and Kirk Hammett on lead guitar. The latter two were late additions to the band. While Hetfield responded to Ulrich's original newspaper placement, guitarists Lloyd Grant and Dave Mustaine, as well as bassist Ron McGovney, would all be added to the band, and the five some would record their first material, contributing the song Hit the Lights to Metal Blade Records' compilation, Metal Massacre. Mustaine would take full lead guitar duty in place of Grant, and McGovney would be replaced soon too after the band saw Cliff Burton play with his group Trauma as they were amazed to see him use a wah-wah pedal and play his bass as if it were a lead guitar. Remarkably, Metallica managed to recruit Cliff as their new bassist. The only condition? They'd have to relocate north to the San Francisco area. This worked just fine with them, as LA was overrun by the glam metal scene, something Metallica wanted to distance themselves from as far as they could. With a couple demos under their belt, the band was ready to record their debut album in 1983, Metal Up Your Ass, only there were a few problems. The label was not cool with the album title, nor the cover which saw a dagger-wielding hand rising out of a toilet bowl, and lead guitarist Dave Mustaine's drug use and violent tendencies had gotten out of control, prompting his firing. There were two quick solutions to these two problems. Pry guitarist Kirk Hammett out of fellow metal band Exodus, and change the album title, to kill them all. It would be released on Megaforce Records, an independent label started out of pocket by promoter Johnny Zazula for the sole purpose of publishing the album, as no one else was interested in supporting the project. Kill em All got the band a following in the underground metal scene. Supported by its two singles Whiplash and Jump in the Fire, it was a breakthrough album for the new genre in development that was thrash metal, a form of metal characterized by its speed and harshness. This was on full display from the band in the purest thrash metal album they would release across their eventual discography, defined by its relentless fast crunchy guitars, screeching solos, pummeling drums, and a young James Hetfield's howling screams. If you needed any indication why Metallica instantly recruited Cliff Burton on bass upon seeing him, the track Pulling Teeth demonstrates not only his musical prowess, but also his innovation and creativity in sound and style. How many other albums have a bass solo as an entire track? Given that the band was unknown and on an independent label, Kill 'Em All sold 17,000 copies in the United States by the end of its first year. They had done two small American tours, during one of which $40,000 worth of the band's gear was stolen after a show. But a European tour saw their fan base really grow, having sold 60,000 copies of the album worldwide by its end. Kill 'Em All has been certified three times platinum for sales of over 3 million. While metal had been around for roughly 15 years at this point, it was rare to hear it played at such a speed, and Metallica would help bring that into popularity. The following year, Metallica would try to up their game. Not only did they want to expand their musical ideals into being more than just pure speed, but bassist Cliff Burton, being the only member classically trained in the group, taught the other members music theory fundamentals to help improve the songwriting as a whole. While Kirk Hammett would take lessons from guitar legend Joe Satriani, Lars Ulrich and James Hetfield were self-taught and really just got to where they were by constantly playing from a young age. This proved to make things more difficult on the band's producer for their second album, Fleming Rasmussen, however they would still prevail. The end result was Ride the Lightning, 
and it certainly saw Metallica create even more of a unique identity for themselves. The album had the inclusion of acoustic guitar, most notably on the ballad Fade to Black, using sounds outside of the members' usual instruments, such as the bell on For Whom the Bell Tolls, and the album's conclusion being a nine minute long atmospheric instrumental, The Call of Cthulhu. This doesn't mean they forgot about their speed, however, evident from the very first song on the album, Fight Fire with Five. The band would go on a European tour followed by an American one, and with minimal play on the radio, simply by performing and word of mouth, Ride the Lightning would sell 85,000 copies in Europe alone by the end of the tour and reach number one on the US Billboard charts, helped by its singles in Fade to Black, Creeping Death, and For Whom the Bell Tolls. In 2012, the album became certified six times platinum. One blunder adding to the band's legacy is a French label misprinted the album resulting in a green cover and the estimated 400 to 2,000 copies are now incredibly sought after. In 1985, a new challenger, yet an old face, approached the scene. Dave Mustaine was back with a newly formed band and was still spiteful towards Metallica. Spiteful about the fact and the way he was kicked out, how, as he claimed, Kirk Hammett got famous off of his guitar solos, and how the group reworked material he had written with them. The best example is The Four Horsemen off Kill Em All, which Metallica turned to be about the biblical characters of the apocalypse after turning down Mustaine's original lyrics which included many euphemisms for intercourse, something they felt was too often used in the glam metal scene. Mustaine would use his song as originally intended under the name Mechanics and played even faster than Metallica on the debut album Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good from his new band Megadeth. The two bands would have a long-running rivalry, and in addition to fellow bands Slayer and Anthrax, would all be dubbed the Big Four of thrash metal. After the success of Ride the Lightning, Metallica would be signed to a multi-year deal from label Elektra Records. The band sought Rush frontman Geddy Lee to produce their third album, but when the two parties could not coordinate their schedules, they would again work with Rasmussen on what would become Master of Puppets. The songs were even more pummeling than ever before. The band opted to try for more longer songs, with three out of the eight tracks each spanning over eight minutes in duration. Hetfield began to transition away from the higher pitched screaming of their earlier works, and the lyricism became much bigger and more socially conscious, dwelling on the flaws of everything from greed to the military to religion. Similar to their previous release, the band needed nothing more than touring and word of mouth to establish their audience, with no radio play nor music videos, and the album's title track being the lone single. It would still peak at 155 on the US Billboard. No, not that album. Kill em all. Metallica had become so huge their old albums were now turning up on the charts too. Master of Puppets would reach 29 on the Billboard and remained on the charts for 72 weeks becoming the band's fastest selling album at the time, with 500,000 copies in its first year and going six times platinum by 2003. It also has the distinction of being the first metal album ever inducted into the National Recording Registry. Metallica would endure a five month long tour of North America opening for Ozzy Osbourne, formerly of Black Sabbath, before embarking on a European one with Anthrax. However, this tour would change the band forever. While navigating through the cold autumn in Sweden, the band's tour bus skidded off the road, propelling Cliff Burton out the window, then landing on top of the 24-year-old bass phenom. It was an utterly gruesome and tragic death, and is debated whether he died instantly or after the crane trying to lift the bus dropped it, crushing him a second time. With the crash occurring in the early hours of one morning, the band isn't convinced by the driver's story of hitting a patch of black ice, and instead believe he may not have been focused enough to drive at that time. Hetfield himself, police, and photographers all looked at the road leading up to the crash and saw no patches of ice, and a detective even stated the bus's track pattern was comparable to those seen after people fall asleep at the wheel. However, the driver was cleared of any wrongdoing. After taking some time to grieve, the band was convinced by their manager the best way to get through was to let it out through their music and keep on going. After holding auditions for a new basis, the group hired Jason Newstead of the band Flotsam and Jetsam, who subsequently appeared on the Garage Days re-revisited EP, featuring the band's covers of various punk and metal songs. The release also included the price of $5.98 in the title to ensure stores wouldn't overprice it. 
With Newstead, they would head back to Europe and make up for some of the shows lost to the original tour's cancellation. The band was back in the studio putting together their fourth album, where we would hear a drastic shift in their sound. Lyrically, it would predominantly deal with themes of ethics and politics in what has been dubbed by the band as their CNN years, where they would watch the news for lyrical inspiration. And Justice For All would expand off tracks from Master of Puppets, such as the title track and Orion, with Metallica creating more lengthy songs that would often take on multiple forms and have different sounding sections within them. This is just one of the many reasons the album's sound stands out among the rest. Hetfield and Ulrich, as the primary songwriters through the band's history, had this obsession with wanting the album to sound as tight as they possibly could, which resulted in the drums being noticeably more condensed with hardly any reverb to be found, in great contrast to how monstrous they often sounded on Master of Puppets. <laughs> On top of that, it was interesting to hear how the new bassist Jason Newstead's style compared to Cliff Burton's. Or, at least it would have been. With the band not knowing a healthy way to deal with the frustration of losing their close friend, and furthermore putting someone new in his place, it resulted in Newstead never really being truly accepted by the other members as they relentlessly hazed him. The most notable example of which was practically muting all his playing on the album, leaving little to no bass to be heard. While on the surface many presume it was done as something personal against Newstead, many excuses have been given such as it was more so just missed due to the band's exhaustion from constant work and the stress their ears were under, and also that Newstead was playing to Hetfield's rhythm parts so it's overshadowed that way. It is a real shame, because obviously Newstead is a great bassist if he was the one selected to join, and producer Fleming Rasmussen spoke highly of his Injustice for All sessions, and both he and the album's mixers disagree with the band's choice of sound. And he goes, okay, now the bass. I said, great part. All right, I want you to drop the bass level down in the mix where you barely audibly can hear it. I thought it was a joke. So I did that, and then for they said, all right, drop it down another 6 to 8 dB. I looked at Hetfield like this, I said, is this guy serious? However, there do now exist fan-made remixes where the bass parts can be heard, thankfully. Nonetheless, the album was a huge success, peaking at number 6 on the US Billboard and being certified 8 times platinum in America. It was supported by a world tour and 3 singles in Harvester of Sorrow, Eye of the Beholder, and One, the latter of which also saw the band's first ever music video and nabbed Metallica their first ever Grammy for Best Metal Performance. The year prior, they were also nominated for the first ever Best Hard Rock Slash Metal Performance Grammy, famously losing to Jethro Tull in what was supposed to be a shoe-in for Metallica. So much so, the manager of Jethro Tull told the group not to bother even going to the awards show in what is considered one of the biggest blunders ever in the Grammy's history. In 1990, the band was again ready for a change in sound. The tightness and lack of bass on Injustice for All generated controversy, but on top of that, the band wasn't always comfortable playing the songs either. Kirk Hammett noticed with the album's long technical portions, fans seemed to get lost and he worried they would become bored. Plus, the band figured at that point they had already pushed their technical and progressive metal capabilities as far as they possibly could on Justice. Metallica parted ways with Fleming Rasmussen as producer for the first time since their 1983 debut Kill 'Em All, and would hire Bob Rock for their upcoming self-titled album, more widely known as The Black Album. He would bring new ideas to the band, such as recording all the members playing simultaneously as opposed to isolated as they always had previously. Things weren't always smooth, however, and conflicts arose between him and Metallica often. The final product showed another drastic shift in the band's sound. The Black Album was everything and Justice For All was not. It was big and bombastic in sound design with the band regaining their use of reverb, they didn't get too experimental or technical, and it was neither progressive nor thrash metal, instead seeing the band shift to a more accessible heavy metal sound. Even right down to the album's image, they knew they wanted to stand out. This saw them not only become one of the biggest metal bands, but one of the biggest bands on the planet, period. The Grammy-winning Black Album was carried by its popular singles in Enter Sandman, The Unforgiven, Nothing Else Matters, Wherever I May Roam, and Sad But True, all of which made it onto the singles chart. The album also debuted at number one on the US Billboard, staying at the top for four straight weeks, while also topping the album charts in eight other countries. 
It also remained on the chart at any position for 488 weeks, the third longest stretch for any album ever. The release took only two weeks to be certified platinum, is currently certified 16 times platinum in the US, and has sold an astounding 31 million copies worldwide. Needless to say, it was a success. 1991 saw the fall of the Soviet Union. What better way to celebrate a newfound brotherhood with the rest of the world than over music? Metallica, Pantera, and ACDC would headline the final show of the Monsters of Rock tour in an airfield for one of the most incredible concerts of all time. Helicopters scoured over the sea of a million and a half people all bonding over their interest of headbanging and rocking out. As massive as this show was, it was hardly the only notable moment in Metallica's promotion of their new album. 1992 saw Metallica and Guns N' Roses tours both align, where the two co-headlined 25 shows with Faith No More opening, with all three bands arguably in their prime. During one of these concerts, on August 8, 1992 in Montreal, James Hetfield got too close to the pyrotechnics on stage and suffered severe burns across his body. With Metallica's set cut short, Guns N' Roses was rushed to take the stage. In the middle of a not so great performance where the band couldn't properly hear themselves, frontman Axl Rose would storm off stage, ending their set early too, and prompting a riot from the disgruntled Montrealers. 1993 saw Metallica's first ever shows in Mexico. They played five straight shows in Mexico City across a six day span, the best content of which was chronicled on the group's first ever live album, Live Shit, Binge and Purge. After years of extensive touring, the band was writing material for their upcoming sixth album in 1995. The album saw them reinvent themselves, both stylistically and in sound. No longer were they these long-haired punk thrashers. They now had short hair and occasionally wore makeup, giving them a much more alternative look, which, dramatic as it may seem, was considered a pretty big deal. With this, they updated their logo as well for an additional change in branding. And their music, having already shifted from thrash to heavy metal on the Black Album, they went even further in the same direction. With 1996's Load, they became more rock, seemingly influenced by the alternative and grunge sound that was popular at the time. Hell, the album saw Metallica try their hand at a country tune in Mama Said. On top of this, James Hetfield had a tendency to get a lot more personal on his lyrics than he ever really had before. This worked out pretty well for them still, as the album peaked at number one on the US Billboard, as well as 14 other countries, after spawning the four singles Until It Sleeps, Hero of the Day, Mama Said, and King Nothing. Lode has since gone on to be certified five times platinum in the United States alone. With how much material had been written at this time, the group initially planned for Lode to be a double album. However, they saw benefits to releasing two albums in a short span instead. This resulted in the aptly titled Reload coming out in 1997, and as you would assume, had very much the same overall style and sound as its predecessor. With the band having written so much material, and the capability of CDs to hold more than records, they used pretty much all the available space they could. Load being a 79 minute album, and Reload 76, with 27 total songs between the two. It too would debut at number one on the US Billboard, remaining on the chart for 75 weeks. Reload gave us the singles The Memory Remains, a sequel to the fan favorite The Unforgiven from the Black Album, Fuel, and Better Than You, the last of which won a Grammy for Best Metal Performance. The album has since been certified three times platinum. After this, the group would put out a double album worth of cover songs called Garage Inc., with recordings spanning from 1984 through 1998. Many of the songs from this compilation come from Metallica's biggest influences in the new wave of British heavy metal and the American punk scenes. While the first disc of the album was made up of newly recorded covers, including the 11 minute track Merciful Fate, an homage to the Danish metal band of the same name, covering five of their songs all in one medley, the second disc included 1987's Garage Days re-revisited EP, as well as covers that had previously served as B-sides to the band's singles. To support the album, Metallica's covers of Turn the Page by Bob Seger, the Grammy-winning performance of Whiskey in the Jar, originally by Thin Lizzy, and Die Die My Darling by Misfits were put out as singles, helping Garage Inc. peak at number two on the US Billboard and be certified five times platinum in America. Shortly after this, Metallica played two concerts with the aid of the San Francisco Symphony that would be recorded. 
The cheekily titled S&M even included two newly written songs specifically for use with the orchestra, Minus Human and No Leaf Clover, the latter of which would be released as a single, as would this live rendition of Nothing Else Matters, though the performance of The Call of Cthulhu would be the one to win them another Grammy. The album peaked at number two on the US Billboard and has sold two and a half million copies in the US. The start of the new millennium threw a real fork in the road at Metallica. Their new song, I Disappear, was made for the Mission Impossible 2 soundtrack, and the band was not pleased to learn an unofficially released demo of it was being played on the radio. Diving deeper into the rabbit hole, they discovered the source was Napster, one of the original peer-to-peer -peer music sharing networks, and the predecessor to the likes of LimeWire or the Pirate Bay. At this time, this was a huge case, because the idea of obtaining a song and sharing it virtually to anybody and everybody for free was so innovative and foreign. While before, your only exposure to music would be through the radio, TV producers obtaining the rights from a band and generally compensated them for usage of their song, purchasing the album yourself, or knowing someone who did, now everyday people on the internet were circumventing this without needing to pay a dime. Not only was this unreleased single available on Napster, the band's entire discography was. Metallica vs. Napster Inc. in 2000 was the first and an ultimately major case in an artist against an online media pirating platform. This is really what snowballed into the public seeing constant PSAs such as You Wouldn't Steal a Car and was a pivotal point in the timeline in the rise of music streaming through the likes of iTunes and Spotify. While the lawsuit was settled, Metallica didn't win many people over. With the major success the band had seen the previous decade, the perception of many towards them had become that the greedy were getting greedier. Look, there's Lars now sitting by his pool. What's the matter with him? This month he was hoping to have a gold-plated Shark Tank bar installed right next to the pool, but thanks to people downloading his music for free, he must now wait a few months before he can afford it. <laughs> Though Metallica's members have made such points as, this wasn't just for themselves, it was for all artists, and that it's not about the money, but the possession of your own material and works. While the band was out fighting this lawsuit, bassist Jason Newstead was itching to get back to making music. He figured in the meantime, he'd get to work on a new band he had helped start, Echo Brain. While Metallica's management thought the group would be promising and told him to go for it, the actual Metallica members didn't feel the same way. They wanted him to be all in on Metallica with James Hetfield growing frustrated enough at the idea to compare Newstead playing in another band as cheating on your wife. Newstead couldn't be all in, so he opted to be all out. The new guy, who the band had so graciously brought in, was now walking out on them. He fucking left the band! He fucking left the band! Which part of that is... Hello? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He fucking left the band! While he admitted the first bit after leaving was tough, it ultimately went well for Newstead. He was now doing what he wanted and no longer had to put up with the continuous 14 year long hazing he previously did. Metallica, now at a crossroad, had to figure where to go from here. They had just gotten ready to start working on a new album when a member quit, and now James Hetfield checked himself into rehab for his addictions predominantly alcoholism. The tumultuous two-year period of a post-Newstead Metallica through the creation of their next album would be covered on the 2004 documentary Some Kind of Monster, produced by Joe Berlinger and Bruce Sinofsky. Fittingly, the same tandem who covered the case and trials of the West Memphis Three in the documentary series Paradise Lost, which just so happens to use the music of Metallica in place of a typical soundtrack. The filming of Some Kind of Monster included over a thousand hours worth of material and showcased the band utilizing a group therapist in Phil Towley to help the members reconnect better, something Lars Ulrich reflects on positively, though Newstead and Hetfield did not. While producer Bob Rock filled in on bass, Metallica would later recruit Robert Trujillo, formerly of Suicidal Tendencies, as their newest member. With how high the tensions were between everyone throughout this period, and the group's ability to persevere through it to get their album done, it seems only fitting they settled on the name Saint Anger for the release. It really is a relic of its time. With a clear influence from the new metal and alternative metal scenes that were big then, it brought a very raw sound constituted of short grungy riffs and more of a steel drum sound that Lars Ulrich still finds himself defending the use of to this day. Maybe even more outlandish was, despite having two incredible guitarists in Kirk Hammond and James Hetfield, not a single guitar solo appears throughout the album. Never once to make their music for anyone but themselves, 
the band was still ultimately satisfied with the release of the record, and feel it is an important one in their discography, considering the state the band was in at the time. Nonetheless, the album was a commercial success, debuting at number one on the US Billboard, among 30 other countries too. Helped by the four singles in its title track, which would win a Grammy, Frantic, The Unnamed Feeling, and Some Kind of Monster, where the documentary drew its name from, the album would be certified double platinum in the United States. After a quick tour in 2003, and then a second longer world tour, both to promote Saint Anger, Metallica took a year-long break from working. Afterwards, they would part ways with Bob Rock, producer of their last four studio albums, and in 2006, announced they'd be working with the legendary Rick Rubin. It was a step in the right direction, as some would say, given fans who had grown tired of the direction Rock took them in during his tenure even started a petition to prohibit the producer from ever working with the band again. Furthermore, the work the band was putting into this new release presented itself as a return to a thrash metal sound, perhaps most comparably to the Injustice for All era given the new song's durations and complexity. Wanting to avoid the mistakes of the Saint Anger sessions, the band certainly had their chemistry back, and while the previous album saw members come into the studio to write parts and improvise on the spot, the sessions for the upcoming album saw the band bring in over 50 hours worth of pre-written instrumental material to start off with. By summer 2008 the album was completed, and in September that year, Death Magnetic would be released. Working with Ruben helped in that the songs have a lot of atmosphere, and with the attention to detail in production, the album is arguably their first to feel bigger than just the band members themselves. Again harking back to the Injustice For All comparison, of the album's 10 tracks, the shortest is a full 5 minutes, and the next after that is 6 and a half. The 6 singles The Day That Never Comes, the Grammy winning My Apocalypse, Cyanide, The Judas Kiss, All Nightmare Long, and Broken Beat and Scarred would propel Death Magnetic to number one on the US Billboard, among 34 other countries, and made Metallica the first band to ever have five consecutive albums debut at number one in the US. Always once to be focused on their image, Metallica brought in a design agency to design the album cover and packaging. The neatest part of this was the original digipacks of the album, where the grave on the cover was cut out all the way through each lyric page within the case, rightfully winning the band a Grammy for best packaging. Just shy of the album's two year anniversary, it was certified double platinum in America. This too would be a busy time for the band. 2009 saw the release of Guitar Hero, Metallica, an edition of the popular game series based solely on the band themselves, with the exception of a few songs by their biggest influences. A month later, they would be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, solidifying the band's status as icons. 2010 saw them participate in Sonosphere, a traveling music festival, but this wasn't any ordinary show. Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, and of course, Anthrax. The big four of thrash metal, all performing on the same bill for the first time ever. While they played a few shows together as part of Sonosphere, the night of June 22nd in Bulgaria was recorded and put out as a live video, the penultimate moment of the show being the encore performance of the Diamond Head song, Am I Evil, by members of all four bands on stage together. 2011 also saw a historic performance from the band, in which they all got their previous members to perform on stage with them at once. The year also marked the release of Beyond Magnetic, an EP of songs from the Death Magnetic sessions that didn't make the cut. In addition to this, 2011 included the release of Metallica's 10th studio album. They had deviated from their sound and style before, but not like this. Nothing they had ever done was like this. Lou Reed, the incredibly artistic and beloved rock icon, and Metallica, the heavy thrashers monolithic in terms of successful metal bands, had struck up a relationship after a joint Rock and Roll Hall of Fame performance and opted to collaborate on an album. It was a marriage of two parties that did not seem like they could be any more unrelated to each other. The original plan was that Metallica would essentially be a backing band, performing the instrumentals to an unreleased theatrical piece written by Reed, based on German playwright Frank Vedekin's Earth Spirit and Pandora's Box. This original idea eventually evolved into Metallica contributing their own musical input to make these songs much more grandiose. The end result was Lulu, which gave us Lou Reed's spoken word poetry, complemented by James Hetfield yelling, occasionally the two simultaneously, over some of the band's longest arrangements. The album, a double album as a matter of fact, while very avant-garde, was hardly the most artistic thing Lou Reed had ever done, hardly even the most bold thing the man ever did. But for Metallica, it was above and beyond in their own right in both these regards. Prompted by its lone single in The View, the album debuted at number 36 on the US Billboard, 
the highest peak for a Lou Reed album in 37 years. While the album understandably was not a commercial success, Metallica still looked back on the record and the experience making it fondly, as they were doing something different and continued to innovate. It was at this time Metallica would really start to get ahead of themselves. In 2012 they debuted their own traveling festival, Orion Music. It only lasted two consecutive installments as apparently it saw significant financial losses for the band. In 2013 they also put out a film, Metallica, Through the Never. It was greatly inspired by other music films such as Pink Floyd's The Wall, in which a story is shown and told predominantly through the band's music with very little additional dialogue. While their film had a budget of $32 million, it made back only under $8 million of that for a $24 million loss. They additionally sold the soundtrack to this on its own, comprised of live recordings of the selected songs, which while it did help recoup some of that damage, it has only sold some tens of thousands of copies. On top of this, in 2013 the band became the first ever act to have played on all seven continents. That's right, they flew down to Antarctica to play a show for 120 scientists stationed there. The experience was filmed and the whole show recorded, with both the documentary and live album entitled Freeze Em All. The band would be on the right path, however, when they left Warner Bros. to start their own label, Blackened Recordings, under which all their new material would be released. They would continue on ventures and promotion before really getting started on another album. These included a new tour, Metallica by Request, in which fans would vote on which songs made the setlist. While an awesome idea, this did have its drawbacks. Kirk Hammett noted that the whole premise was you could hear any song in the band's whole discography, and the most voted songs were the same ones the band already played regularly in their set list. At this time, the band did also premiere a new non-album single, Lords of Summer. On top of this, with the success of sports teams in the band's native area, we got to see James and Kirk perform the Star Spangled Banner before playoff finals games, three times throughout the decade, as well as an annual Metallica night partnership with the San Francisco Giants. The band also played a Night Before concert prior to Super Bowl 50, where they announced an update on the upcoming album. In 2016, the group's newest release, the double album Hardwired to Self-Destruct, would be put out. They still very much had their death magnetic type sound to it. Sensible, given Greg Fiddleman, the engineer and mixer of that album, would be the one producing Hardwired. The album was predominantly written by Hetfield and Ulrich. This came due to Kirk Hammett losing his phone in an airport which contained an estimated 250 different riff ideas on it, leaving him too demoralized creatively to restart. The album was still a huge success, peaking at number one on the album starts in 57 different countries. It was supported by five singles in Hardwired, Moth Into Flame, Atlas Rise, Now That We're Dead, and Spit Out The Bone. The album currently sits at over 2 million copies sold worldwide, with the 1 million of those coming from the US alone, certifying it platinum by the Recording Industry Association of America. A deluxe edition of the album was also released which included the 2014 single Lords of Summer as well as covers of Rainbow, Deep Purple, and Iron Maiden as well as live material from 2016. In celebration of the 20th anniversary of their album S&M, Metallica would again team up with the San Francisco Symphony in 2019 for some shows, the material from one of which would be later released as S&M 2. The album would be supported by a single, being the performance of the St. Anger track All Within My Hands. This concert too was documented, and upon release in theaters generated five and a half million dollars. Not long after this though, James Hetfield would unfortunately have to check himself back into rehab for alcoholism, calling off upcoming shows the band had planned. With the eventual outbreak of COVID-19, we can only hope that took pressure off of him so as he wouldn't have to try and rush through this healing process and that he could spend more time with his family. To keep in touch with fans, the band started their series Metallica Mondays, where each Monday they would stream a previous concert of theirs in full. While most of the 24 performances are from the 2000s and 2010s, they do date as far back as 1983. Early on in 2020, Lars Ulrich stated that Metallica were beginning to work on a new album through the pandemic. Later on in the year, as part of Rolling Stone magazine's Artist on Artist series, he admitted to singer-songwriter Phoebe Bridgers that Metallica was a few weeks into some pretty serious songwriting. Furthermore, in May of this year it came out that they've got the skeletons of roughly 10 songs completed through the band's Zoom meetings. While there is no indication of when we'll get our hands on these songs, in the meantime the band has prepared an incredible 30th anniversary box set of the Black Album for us. The Metallica Blacklist, as it is called, featured all 12 of the original album songs covered by a variety of artists spanning across four CDs. These include performances from the likes of Ghost, Weezer, Corey Taylor, and Volbeat. 
to more outlandish and unexpected crossovers such as Flatbush Zombies, The Neptunes, and Kamasi Washington, and the album was released September 10th. So there you have it, a breakdown of the metal giant's career, and what a career it has been. From their pivotal involvement in developing a new scene from the underground, to reaching the highest heights, maybe of any metal band ever. And just as they've claimed right from the start, 